Hey guys, welcome back to Wolf from there, and welcome to an RU2501 Premium Review. Now to start things off, I want to apologise for the last week's video, which was on the exact same topic. I explained things a little bit flimsy, and a lot of people got upset by that. Let me try again. The prefix of the video was to explain why the RU251 performs better at a top tier 8.0, 8.3 or 9.0 than it does at 6.7. It comes down to a couple of factors. First of which is to understand that the RU251 is pretty much another version of the Leo. It has a bit less armor, has no stabilized gun, a weaker gun and an overall weaker shell. But the tank is more maneuverable, has um, an overall better I'd say survivability in the sense that um, it drives around and is able to maybe evade 80 GM shells at a bit of a faster pace than the Leopard has. Overall, I think the tank and the Leo are very much on par. Both of them are very good. Uh, with the Leo, you can be a bit more of a brawler. You can, you know, use that gun for a bit more damage. With the RU251, you got to take a little bit of precautions. That is saying we're playing it at top tier. To understand why this vehicle performs better at top tier than it does at bottom tier, we need to understand what shells are being fired and what shells we're using. Now, if you're playing the RU251, the shell you should be using is the Heat FS. The Hesh is not useful and the high explosive shell is completely redundant. Heat FS has one job. Its job is to either eliminate all the crew members in one shot, and the other one is to eliminate the enemy's Amorak or the fuel tanks. The problem is that at Battery 9.0, everything is firing Heat FS which means that the weak spot is always going to be Amorak. The meta of the game at top tier, the thought process behind top tier, is you're firing Heat FS and Heat FS is being fired at you. Heat FS is being fired at you towards your Amorak and you're firing your Heat FS towards the Amorak. This is good because the RU251 has a very high survivability range. Now, to explain survivability, um, I like to explain survivability as overall how many shells, on average, for an average player, will it take to kill a tank? Now, to kill something like a T-10M, it will take quite a few shells if you don't know where the weak spots are. To kill an RU-251, it takes only one shell. That is, if the one shell is armor-piercing high explosive. And at Battle Ring 6.7, which is where this tank currently sits, and where most people are currently playing it, everything is firing at you with armor-piercing high explosive shells. To explain what an armor-piercing high explosive shell does to your tank, it kills it in one shot because it's going to penetrate, you have no armor, and as soon as it penetrates, it will blow up, and the high explosive rounds will kill the remainder of your crew members. However, in top tier, 9.0 or 8.3, the vehicle is being impacted by Sabo shells and by high explosive. These are very accurate projectiles. They only kill what the line of sight sees, which means if the enemy doesn't hit your Amorak dead on, and if you're carrying, like I like to do, 17 shells around about, your Amorak is very small, which means unless they're aiming precisely for the lower portion of the lower glaciers, they won't be able to one-shot you. Your crew members are distributed to two on the left and two on the right, so if the enemy chooses to shoot either left or right, they will kill at maximum two of your crew members, leaving the tank alive. Now, what I'm not saying is that you'll get shot and you'll get away. No, what I'm saying is you'll get shot, but you won't get one-shot. And one-shot kills are one of the reasons you don't get enough spawn points to be later able to provide support for your team. And this is one of the tricks of the current way the game works. To produce spawn points, you can do them by also collecting damage. That's why uh, vehicles like the Mouse or the Yak Tiger are extremely effective, because they collect damage over long periods of time, and you're able to then get a lot of spawn points where you can spawn in aircraft, tanks, uh, or bombers, or whatnot. So, the RU-251's main advantage at being played at top tier is that it takes advantage of its heat FS shell, which is still perfectly capable of killing the enemies, and it receives an additional survivability because the enemies are firing very precision aimed APDS and heat FS shells, which in most cases will take two or more shells to kill your tank. And that's going to be working with your spawn points, which of course implicates your lineup and uh, gives you a lot more effectiveness in the game. Now, to touch onto the lineups and to touch onto one of the most controversial parts of this tank, which is the pay-to-win aspect, um, I'll just put it out there cleanly. My opinion is there's no tank in the game that's pay-to-win. And that's because it doesn't have a pay-to-win lineup. And it, even if there was some type of plane that you could combine with it, the tank to be pay-to-win by the standard of the community, I think, is a vehicle that's under tiered. At least that's what I'm, I'm seeing. I think people don't like when a vehicle with performance of 8.0, is at a battle rating of 6.7.
The ITIF of one, in my eyes, is good at 6.7. It's a really good premium vehicle. You can buy and play at 6.7 today. Or you can buy it, put it into a 9.0 lineup, and you have an excellent vehicle. That's, that's the way I look at it. I look at this vehicle as a premium vehicle that was put into the game for top tier players. It's there for anybody that's looking to have a little bit of fun playing this vehicle at 9.0, because that's where it shines. I'm not saying it's bad at 6.7, I'm not saying that it's not slightly controversial, but everything can kill it. And the only way that I can see the Iron of one be annoying is if somebody uses it to flank around the side of the map. And flank around the side of the map in a light tank is never effective for your RP. When you're looking for a premium tank, your primary goal, I'm guessing, is to acquire large amounts of research points to unlock your vehicles. And if you want to get large amounts of research points, you have to follow two factors. Getting damage, getting a lot of points, and winning. And with the current 6.7 performance of the i 2 one maybe from the way players are playing it, mainly from the way the teams are reacting to it, to put it plainly, it has a bad win ratio. A bad win ratio means that, well, currently, 44%. And let's just average it out to 50. In a case of 50% win ratio, that means you're only getting maximum amounts of RP for a good match 50% of the time. You play 10 matches, only 5 of those are your maximum RP. That is not what you want to have. With my current playtime, um, I've gone through probably a one week and a half now of playing the i 2 for one at top tier, combining it with the mouse, combining it with the Leopard, the CL13. I've been able to get a lot more consistent wins out of it and have had a blast playing it. From a perspective of a player who has spent a lot of time in 6.7 and more time in 9.0, I have to say that if you're looking to buy the IU251, it is a perfect tank to fit for 9.0 meta. At 6.7, you would actually be better off driving the Yak Panther. And we haven't even mentioned the cost. The IU251 costs around 7,500 Golden Eagles, which is a plentiful. And I think it's a vehicle more meant for those who are looking for a real extreme challenge. I-251 is good, but it isn't easy to play. As a light tank, it takes a lot of precaution, and because you're maneuverable, it is on you to take care of the objectives as well. Those of you who watch the tactic I use in this video, I'll just run it down real quick. I pushed Alpha, which is the hardest point to hold on the map, and I then proceeded through Charlie, capturing that, and also then helping my team secure the remainder of the map. It's tactics, it's winning, and it's getting good results that make the I-251 worth it but really it's worth it at 9.0, way more than it is at 6.7.